Today's Bible reading is taken from 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. It can be found on the Bible in front of you in page 1687. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, reading from verse 1. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourself know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, We worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive, They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and eat and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Thank you so much, Jenny, and uh, wonderful to be with you again today as we tuck into this part of God's Word. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed the opportunity to just keep reading and uh, being refreshed in what, what is essentially a very simple letter, but with profound implications. Uh, there's an outline in the leaflet. I hope that's uh, useful for you as we get, get in. Let me pray that God might speak to our hearts and minds. Father, we do thank you that you're a God who speaks to us. You speak to us about important things. Uh, You frame eternity and you help us to understand where we fit into that eternal plan of yours. Father, do reinforce that in our minds and hearts today so that we might live faithfully for you as we anticipate the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. When my son David was going to university, I thought it'd be a good idea to give him a Christian book, one that would uh, encourage him. And I thought I'd give him a book by John Piper. Uh, Some of you may know John Piper. He is uh, an American author, written many, many books. And uh, as I was struggling to work out what book I would give him, I decided on uh, this book, which has come up on the screen, right? Don't Waste Your Life. Now, um, I I thought the book was good. I hadn't really thought much about the title. Uh, But when David got this book, uh, he went and spoke to Sue, my wife, and he said, does Dad think... I'm wasting my life. Uh, So I obviously failed Parenting 101 uh, in a dismal sort of way. And yet the book itself raises an important issue. None of us want to waste our lives, do we? Uh, None of us uh, want to see it all fritted away. We want to make the most of the one life that we have. And in our culture, often what that does is it translates into busyness and activity and lots of different things that you fill up your life with. But of course, we all know that busyness 
is not the same as making the most of your life. Those two things don't necessarily equate. When we turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul is concerned that the Thessalonian believers are not making the best use of their time while they wait for Jesus to return. Now, understand that Paul is incredibly positive about this church. You only have to read 1 Thessalonians at the start or even the start of this letter to know that they, these are his pin-up people. You know, he is very, very positive about them. But last week we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he had a concern. There were false teachers who'd infiltrated the ranks of this church and they were saying Jesus had already returned or was about to return. The imminence of that return was right on the doorstep. And Paul the Apostle was particularly concerned about the impact that it was having as they thought about their, their employment or their, their work. You can pick that up. Turn, have the letter open in front of you. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 uh, captures it well. Keep away from every believer who is idle. Or if you uh, move on to verse 11. Some among you are idle and disruptive. Um, it, it, the same sort of issue he refers back to in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 and 5, that issue of idleness. Now, as best we can work out, uh, the, the believers, uh, the false teachers, they were saying that Jesus had already returned, was about to return. As a result... The believers in this church were thinking, well, if Jesus has already returned or is about to, about to return, what's the point of working? You know, like, that's a waste of time, isn't it? Get out the deck chairs, put on the suntan lotion, you know, go and sit down by the beach, improve your tan, because Jesus is going to come at any moment. What point is there in any a crust while we wait? And what Paul does, he does an enormously helpful thing. He gives input on teaching about the return of the Lord, but he also models in his own life the way in which we should think about how to live as we wait for the return of the Lord. And you see that being played out in this chapter. His concern is that these believers might make the most of their lives as they wait for the day of the Lord. Now, let me say, as I preach this morning, as we open up this word and we read it together, this is my concern for us. Right? How will we make the most of our time as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to do that, don't you? Do you want to do that? Do you want to make the most of your life as you wait for the return of the Lord Jesus? That's what this chapter is all about. Now, let, let me pause. I'm going to do an ad right now. Uh, Remember, we've been talking about the deep dive into the day of the Lord. There'll be a screenshot that will come up about this. It's coming up this Thursday. I don't think we take into account the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, anywhere near enough. Or maybe you do, but I don't think I do as I reflect on my life. This letter's brought up that issue, but there's a much wider, richer teaching in the New Testament and the whole Bible on the day of the Lord. This Thursday, 730 if, if you think you've thought about it enough, that's fine, you don't need to come. But if you reckon you've got something more to learn in this space and to think about and reflect on, come on Thursday so you can be encouraged as Mike Rowe helps us think about it, but also answers questions that we're wrestling with, okay? Thursday, deep dive. Yeah, it'd be great if you could come along. Okay, well, let's uh, turn back to 2 Thessalonians 3. It, where I want to start is to... Talk about the nature of the way our calling is meant to dictate what we do with our lives. And I'm doing that by drawing on a sort of a wider teaching that Paul gives us in 1 and 2 Thessalonians before he jumps into the issue of work. Uh, stick with me and see if you can see the logic of the way he pulls this apart. In our um, culture, uh, often we use the word calling to refer to jobs or careers. You know, what, what are you called to do? It's often relating to our, our sort of working vocation in life. When we turn to the New Testament, particularly 1 and 2 Thessalonians, when it talks about calling, it's something much more profound than a job, something much more central. It's not whether you're a carpenter or a nurse or an accountant or a shopkeeper or a programmer or a doctor or a lawyer. When it talks about calling, that's not what's in the agenda. 
1 and 2 Thessalonians in particular refer to calling and they use that interchangeably with being a Christian. Christian equals called one. That's the way these two letters talk. Let me show you a couple of spots in 1, 1 and 2 Thessalonians where you see this being played out. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 12, uh, Paul urged the Thessalonians to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. God's a calling God. He calls people into a relationship with himself. That makes them called ones. Same idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. The one who calls you is faithful. God calls you into his family and he's faithful to you as you live in that calling. If you come to 2 Thessalonians, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, chapter 1, verse 11. Paul is praying, and he prays that God may count you worthy of his calling. Christian? You call yourself a Christian? You're a called one. You can say called one, that means Christian. That's what's going on here. Now, as we dig into 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, what we see is that Paul wants this idea of our calling, the relationship we have with God, to dominate every aspect of how we live the whole of life, and that includes our attitude towards employment or, or, in fact, any activity that we take up day by day, our calling affects what we do as we wait for the Lord to return. That's the framework that he's setting in place, and I think it's important for us to actually understand that's the, the big picture thing he's working with. Now, with me, just dig in with me for a moment and look at Paul as a case study as he tries to work this one out, and particularly as he talks about working. I think it's really illustrative. Uh, as I said, Paul teaches and uses his behaviour to show them uh, how, how this idea of calling works out in practice. So 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1, he says, Pray for us that the message of the Lord, literally when it says message of the Lord, it's, it's word of the Lord. So message of the Lord, word of the Lord, that it may spread rapidly and be honoured, just as it was with you. Now, I want to suggest that uh, while none of us are apostles, right, none of us fall in, into that category, but all of us, uh, with the apostle, are to pray for and participate in exactly this same mission. His concern is our concern. And what is it? That will be about the rapid spread of the word of the Lord. That's what we're on about as a church. Rapid, because there's an urgency, isn't there, as we wait for the Lord Jesus to return to this world. The time is short. But you might say to me, well, I'm not so convinced that we ought to be comparing ourselves with the Apostle Paul, right? He's in a different category, right? He's an apostle called by Jesus. Yeah, he's the sort of guy who uh, planted churches all around the known world. He evangelised. He wrote big slabs in the New Testament. None of us have done that. Surely he's in a different category from you or I. Yeah, his job was to be an apostle. Mine isn't. Okay. Now, there, there is a truth in that. But when you dig a bit, bit deeper, you see that that's not quite right, even in Paul's example in his life. So if you look with me, uh, Paul did preach and teach. There was an apostolic role that he had uh, back in 1 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. He says, We dared to tell you the gospel in spite of strong opposition. Or in verse 8 of that same chapter, We shared with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. The apostle set apart to preach the gospel and take the gospel to the known world. Quite right. But notice that this, this apostle also is holding down a secular job. Isn't that interesting? So 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, We were not idle when we were with you. We worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so we wouldn't be a burden to any of you. He wants to make the most of his life, the rapid spread of the word of the Lord, and so what he does is he holds down two full-time jobs. Right? One, preaching and teaching, and one probably as a tent maker on the side. Now, here, look, let's do a bit of a critique of the apostle at this point, you know, politely. Uh, surely if he's an apostle about the rapid spread of the word of the Lord, he shouldn't get distracted by tent making. 
Right? You should focus on the task of evangelizing, church planting, writing. I mean, shouldn't he have done that? I mean, why? Why does he tent make on the side? You know, is he uh, a workaholic? You know, he didn't have to sleep, so he preached during the day and everyone was sleeping. He made tents at night. He thought he'd do that, workaholic. Or maybe he's a materialist. And he's thinking, ah, oh, there's a few sort of, you know, tours I want to take around the Mediterranean. I better earn a bit of cash to pay for that, you know. And, uh, and obviously that's not true either. So why does he work and be about the rapid spread of the word of the Lord? It's because he's fulfilling his calling. See, how does he serve the Lord well with his life in his context? That's what he says, verse 8. The reason he, he did that was so he didn't, want to, he didn't want to be a burden to distract people from hearing the word of the Lord, maybe because they thought he was just doing the preaching to get money from that task. He didn't want them deflected from the rapid spread of the gospel. But also in verse 9, notice how he describes himself as a model of how to live responsibly while we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus with that concern for the rapid spread of the gospel. Friends, can can I say it is the same for us in this respect, in this respect. Most of us are like the Apostle Paul in that we are bivocational. Uh, We are called uh, into the family of God to live faithfully for our God. Most of us hold down paying jobs, but understand our big concern is for the rapid spread of the word of the Lord. That's what we're on about because we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that we work is quite incidental to that overarching concern take the gospel out my brothers and sisters in Christ you want your calling to profoundly shape how you live and how you serve now because this is one of the few passages I think in the New Testament that takes some time to pull apart thinking about work or employment, I do do just want to sort of take a bit of a sidetrack here for just a moment and to explore this a little bit with you. A couple of observations. What you pick up here is that when you're reflecting on your paid employment, if that's your situation, you don't want to be lazy or or slack. Go back to uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6. It says, Keep away from every brother who is idle, and doesn't live according to the teaching that you received from us. Uh, I think there are two sort of potential extremes that Christians can fall into. They can minimise and diminish paid employment, or they can put too much emphasis and weight on it. Uh, And some of that depends on the cultural context you find yourself in, and some of that may have been playing out in this church uh, the Thessalonians belong to. There's the possibility of minimising or being slack in work. I, I went to a physio just the other day, I think I mentioned that last week, and while I was on the table and he was pressing around in different things in my neck and I had my mouth in that little hole, you know, I thought I'd ask him some questions. So I said, hey, you know, fairly big medi- uh, you know, medical sort of physio practice. I said, how, do you, how are you going recruiting young graduates into um, you know, this practice? He's, he was late 30s, I reckon. He, said, he just groaned. He went, oh, it's terrible. You know? And I said, why? He said, he said, most of them don't want to work. And I said, yeah, sort of tell me more. He said, well, look, the way it is, we interview people to come and join the practice, and you can tell straight away where they're coming from. If they start with you know, work-life balance, you know, what they're trying to do is to minimise the work portion of that, and they don't seem to want to learn much, they don't think they're learners in this space to become good practitioners, they don't want to absorb the ethos of our you know, practice in order to care for people. He said, it's a real nuisance. And he said, that's been a growing trend of graduates coming. I'm not insulting any physio students here today, or don't, 
Don't hear me doing that. But he's saying real trend that's happened over the last 10 years in his employment practices. I think you can, believers can actually take something of that attitude, right? What are we on about? The rapid spread of the word of the Lord. So what we need to do is to minimise the amount of time we spend at work, you know, be 8.30 to 5, you know, watch the clock, get out as fast, because you've got more important things to do, okay? I don't think we're being encouraged to do that, but we're being encouraged to be faithful in the work that we're called to do, faithful to the Lord, faithful not clock watchers. But I suspect that that's not the biggest issue for a congregation like this when it comes to employment. The more likely issue we wrestle with is overwork. And partially because we see work as being too important and too important to us in terms of our identity. It's interesting that Australians, uh, when the surveys have done, we still work some of the longest hours at work in the Western world. Yeah, you know, the land of the long weekend, you know. We are dedicated to overperforming in terms of those hours. As believers, we need to have work in its right space. We actually do need to understand the limits of work. Do let's say you are uh, the person at work who has the highest sales, you're a salesperson, highest sales figures of anyone in the company consistently month on month on month on month, okay? Can I say your boss is unlikely to come up to you and say, I have perceived that you have very high sales figure figures, you know, it's extraordinary, and I'm thinking that you are a worshipper of the Lord of heaven and earth. Okay, I'm I don't think that's the case. I'm not saying the way you go about your work can't impact other people and make them ask questions, but your work never causes people to come into the kingdom. Do you understand that is an impossibility for that to happen? Because it's only the word of the Lord that actually helps people come into the kingdom and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there are limits to work. Notice also the, the way in which he spells out the motives uh, for working. If you go to a place like chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Even when we're with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. Now, I think this is a really foreign idea to our ears. Most of us don't think it's the primary, primary point about work is to make sure we've got something to eat at breakfast time. We live in a very affluent culture and most of us work for extras really you know leisure holidays travel you know the nice bike with the carbon fiber wheels you know like there are all sorts of things that you can actually think about and preoccupied get preoccupied by and you if you're a student here today you might at this point be feeling a little bit morally superior in the space uh, most of the students I talk to uh, don't have a lot of income necessarily, but they do have very long shopping lists uh, for what they will do with money when they get out of university. So it's, it's a challenging sort of space to be in, I think. One of the big dangers uh, for educated groups like ours is that we can actually place too much emphasis on our work and what it means. And in, in particular, this is the subtle one that really can tend to eat you alive. That your esteem, your sense of well-being and who you are is tied up with what you do in your job. Now understand, a Christian should never think that way. Never. Who you are is defined by your relationship with the Lord of heaven and earth who calls you into his family, not by the job that you give yourself to. Do you understand the, the sort of folly of thinking that way? Why would you allow the creation, what you turn your hands to, to dictate who you are, rather than the Lord of heaven and earth who created you? And from that point of view, how can you change your sense of self-worth and value? How can you improve that in any way than by knowing you're a called one in the family of God? 
and he calls you to be faithful in all of life. That's the faithfulness bit. It's not the identity bit that comes back to you. Okay? There's very helpful insights into how we think about ourselves and work in this chapter. Let me just swing back, though, to the, the big issue that's going on, I think, in this letter and this chapter. The Apostle, Paul the Apostle, he wants us to make the most of our time until the Lord Jesus returns. The most of our time until he returns, until the day of the Lord. So, a few observations. How should we pray as we wait for the return of the Lord? Look again uh, at chapter 3, verse 1. Paul asks them to pray for him and uh, his companions. And then in verse 2, you get some of the content of that prayer. That we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. Now, is he praying at this point that the apostle and his apostolic band will be protected from persecution and harm? If that's the case, can I say... Either the Thessalonians didn't pray or it didn't get answered. Right? Because if you go to a spot like 2, Thess- uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul there speaks about imprisonment, floggings, danger, peril at every moment. If you go through Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles are always getting arrested, beaten, even killed. Right? So I don't think he is praying for protection for his personal well-being. So what's he praying for? What's he asking them to pray for? Notice in verse uh, verse 2 of chapter 3, he talks about evil people. Who who are the evil people that he's referring to? Back in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16, he again refers to those people. He said, they're the ones who try and keep Paul from speaking to the Gentiles so they might be saved. Or... When you go to the chapter we looked at last week, uh, it spoke in verses, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 about the lawless one, you know, the personification of evil and opposition to God, uh, the one who deceives those who are perishing. Here's what I think Paul is asking them to pray. Not for his personal safety, but that those who oppose the gospel will be prevented from blocking the rapid spread of the gospel. That they will be limited by God so that his name may be glorified as the gospel goes out. Uh, Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what we ought to pray. Uh, That we as a church might have the great privilege of being involved in the rapid spread of the word of the Lord and that those who would oppose it will be held back by God so the gospel can go forth. Uh, Some of us will suffer persecution and opposition and trials and troubles because we do that, but if the word of the Lord goes forth, then it doesn't matter. That's the content of Paul's prayer. Let me move on. We, we don't know when Jesus will return. We know we're in the last days. Nothing needs to happen before the end of the age is ushered in. So how do we live with the right sense of urgency in this space? Sometimes uh, people say to me, well, we should live like it's our last day. Every day you should live like it's your last day. And I want to say... Yes, yes, and no, okay? Uh, yes and no. Let me, let me tell you the, the no bit, then the yes bit, all right? No, I don't think we should live like it's our last day from this point of view. The Thessalonian church had a problem. They expected that Jesus would return probably at any moment, and as a result, they thought, well, there's no point, point in working, right? It's the last day. So let's down tools, take it easy, you know, sit, sit at the harbour and wait for Jesus to cruise in. That was the sort of picture that was being painted. And Paul says, wrong. Faithful in the light of the return of the Lord means ongoing faithfulness in your work. Not pulling up 
you know, stumps and stopping your work. And it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if today is your last day or tomorrow is the last day and your boss at work comes to you and says, look, I've got this three-month project I want you to start, then should you say, no way, right? This is the last day, I'm not doing that, that'd be a waste of time, right? Probably not, is my guess. You see, do you, do you understand? That's the, the sort of no component. We don't know the day when Jesus will return, but we want to live with a sense of urgency in the light of that and faithfulness in all of life as we do that. And then there's a yes component to it. That is, there's, there's a no, but there's also a yes component because you do want to live with a sense of urgency and priority and expectancy and not lose sight or get vague about the fact that Jesus will return to wind up the history of this world. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you as a community of God's people to make sure that we're about the rapid spread of the word of the Lord. And can I say over the years, uh, Sue and I have been extraordinarily privileged to be surrounded by men and women who have done this. Last month, uh, I came home after a board meeting for the network. Uh, it was a strategic meeting trying to think about where our network would be going over the next five to ten years. And I said to Sue, this it was so encouraging. These men and women you know, who hold down jobs during the day, but their passion is to see the gospel going forth. And they said, what we want to be on about is evangelising people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, multiplying the number of churches that there are so that more people are reached with the gospel. Let me say, these were men and women who were preoccupied with that concern even though they actually had day jobs. But it's the case with everybody, actually. Well, not everybody, but with lots of people in this community who are trying to work that out. Uh, people who are working out how they can use the skills and gifts they have to promote the gospel. There's one guy I know in this church who years ago came to me and said, look, I've worked out I'm not very good at evangelising at all. I really am not good at that at all. He said, but I'm really good at making money. You know, really good at that. So he said, I figure what I'll do is I'll make a lot of money and I'm going to pour that money into gospel work in order that the gospel can go out. Do you understand? He's about the rapid spread of the word of the Lord. Different people have kept doing that. You know, I hear um, retirees thinking about how they'll be about the rapid spread of the gospel as they think about the relationships they have in their context. Last uh, Sunday, I think it was, I was talking to someone out in the yard who said, look, I'm at this stage in life where I think if I work for a few more years, I can create space so that I can take an early retirement, early mid-50s, and dedicate more time to sort of gospel work that is sort of cutting edge in that space. So I'm organising things so I'll be able to do that. Uh, we have people in this church who are connected with organisations like the Purdy's are, uh, are working with, uh, CMS. They serve in that context so that the gospel can go forth in an international sort of way. We have a church full of people who have that sort of concern and desire to see the gospel going out. And, and my friends, it is enormously encouraging that people are working at that. It is not going to be long before every single one of us are ushered into eternity. Either because you die or because the Lord Jesus returns. Now, that is the reality. What will count then? What will stand the test of eternity? I mentioned John Piper uh, at the start, the book, don't waste your life. John Piper was quite famous for a talk he gave on a campus several decades ago. Outdoor, meeting, uh, and hundreds and hundreds of university students were gathered. And he talked about this couple he knew who'd retired early to Florida, where they had a motorised yacht, and they spent their days cruising around the yacht, uh, playing volleyball on the beach, 
and collecting seashells. Right? Those were the three prime activities they had in life. And Piper said to this group of students who were gathered, uh, and he wanted to challenge them, he said, can you imagine turning up on the last day, of the day of judgment before God, and saying, here, God, look at my seashell collection. It just won't cut it, will it? Now, what you want to do with your life, old, young, somewhere in between, is keep thinking how you can be about that rapid spread of the word of the Lord as you wait for the Lord's return. Keep calibrating your life, asking the questions so you utilise your time to good effect for his glory. Let me pray that that's exactly what we'll do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that uh, you're a God who uh, speaks to us clearly. You, you do give us a framework for thinking about all of eternity, and we know that's an extraordinary privilege. And Father, we ask that as we reflect on our lives, uh, that you would give us perspective on work, uh, the things, often things that trouble us and consume our energy and time, that you help us to calibrate those in the light, light of eternity and to make good, wise decisions about how we spend our lives and how we invest uh, as we think about the coming kingdom. Uh, Father, we pray that we'll be a church that will encourage one another in this enterprise, spur one another on, and live for your glory and honour. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.